All right, y'all, so uh, welcome. My name is Brian Schneedy, and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager with the Dutchess Land Conservancy. Uh, we want to thank you once again for joining us uh, in our final webinar of this season of our Earth Matters series. Uh, we really, really enjoy hosting these events and want to thank you for attending over this past season. So tonight, we are very excited to welcome Rick Carr, um, farm manager and master composter at the Rodale Institute as he delivers his presentation. Uh, but first, let's go over some basic logistics about tonight's webinar, followed by a brief introduction to the Duchess Land Conservancy and tonight's presenter. Uh, so first, uh, you're muted to ensure that there's no interruption during the presentation. Uh, second, the raise hand function is disabled. Uh, feel free to enter all your questions into the Q&A box. And we are doing it a little bit different tonight for those who are used to our Earth Matters series. Uh, Rick will try to answer questions that come up in the Q&A as they come in or shortly after they come in, so that'll be fun. Uh, chat is disabled for this event. Uh, closed captioning is enabled, and you can find that at the bottom of your screen. And then finally, I'd love to hand it over to Julie Hart, our education director, who'll tell you a bit about the DLC, this webinar series, and our guest presenter, Julie. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Hart, an ecologist and educator here at the Dutchess Land Conservancy. Many of you are probably familiar with the DLC, but for anyone who's not, let me give you a quick overview. The Dutchess Land Conservancy is a private nonprofit land conservation organization located in the Hudson Valley of New York State, and we are dedicated to preserving the farms, forests, wetlands and waterways, open spaces and wildlife habitats of Dutchess County. We are an accredited land trust, and since our founding in 1985, we have worked with hundreds of landowners and protected over 46,000 acres of land. And I also want to say many thanks to the Molly B. Schaefer Education Fund for sponsoring this event. This is the final installment of our winter webinar series, Earth Matters, and we want to thank you for coming along with us through a wonderful season of interesting and informative speakers, all of them digging into the various aspects of the topic of soil health. We've learned about soil food webs, regenerative soil management practices, the effects of antibiotics on soil biota, and ecology of soil health. Our theme throughout the season has been very simple. Soil is not dirt. And so tonight we're gonna to wrap up the season with a deep dive into the compost bin. So let's get started. Tonight we are thrilled to welcome Rick Carr, who is the farm manager and master composter at the Rodale Institute. That's a research institute that's leading the way in researching the cultivation of healthy living soils. If you're not familiar with Rodale, please check out their website. It's rodaleinstitute.org. They have loads of amazing resources on regenerative agriculture. And it's no exaggeration to say they literally wrote the book on organic farming and gardening. Rick has been studying the science and utilization of compost, vermicompost, and liquid compost extracts through laboratory research and field applications. And as compost production specialist, Rick manages the Rodale Institute's large-scale composting facility and oversees field applications of compost in several projects. As the farm director, Rick manages all farming operations across Rodale Institute's eight campuses. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rick to talk about the composting and vermicomposting, separating the feel good from the real good. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that, Julie, and for the rest of the team for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this, uh, this, this series, uh, Earth Matters. Uh, and as Julie mentioned, I, uh, well, right there's the, um, the agenda that you have seen and, um, I guess, for, yeah, for the repeat the housekeeping, I, my last webinar presentation, I did try answering questions throughout, more comfortable actually for the presenter, at least me as a presenter, I like it to be dynamic and helps me break up my, uh, my dialogue. Um, so we'll get to it. If I don't get to your question, we'll try to get it to it at the very end, but I do have my question and answer box open. And as, these, as I see things come up and finish my thoughts, I will pause and try to answer a question. Um, so with that, let's get started. Okay, so Julie did mention about Rodale Institute, and thank you very much for that. You saved me about a minute or two, uh, and yes, check out our website for everything that's going on. I'm not going to give the entire history of Rodale, uh, but what you're looking at here is our property in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. It's 386 acres. And it's most of the uh, foreground that you see in this picture. And so we're very diverse. 
We have two large scale composting operations. Uh, we have two apple orchards, grain production, vegetable production. We have a hog facility. What else? We have uh, ongoing trials. Uh, one of our flagship, flagship trials is the um, farming systems trial started in 1981. And it's ongoing today comparing side-by-side uh, -side organic and conventional agriculture. We started in 2015, a vegetable systems trial uh, doing the same thing. Uh, we have a full suite of farming equipment. We do tours, outreach, education, a couple ponds, uh, pastures for grazing animals. So we're quite diverse compared to the ordinary farm. I started in 2013 as a compost production specialist. Most of my background has been in compost science. Um, it's a shrinking background now where uh, most of my time was in the laboratory or doing outreach and education for the master composters in Tompkins County. Uh, but I managed the compost operation and did any of the compost related activities. I still do, but I also have a larger amount of responsibilities in just managing farms and all the activities that are ongoing there. And we have eight or nine farms across the United States and one in Italy right now that we're operating at. All right, so with that, let's get into the presentation. Uh, first and foremost is why compost? Why should we care about this? And uh, there's two thoughts to it um, that um, I, I find the, a growing number of my audience, uh, particularly the uh, practitioners, that they're really focused on just the final product. But if you look at this pile of waste here, um, composting is simply managed aerobic decomposition. So nature will break that down and a farmer here is gonna put that into a pile. And if he manages it uh, appropriately, we could turn it into a usable resource. Uh, the backyard level, and I'm gonna kind of tie into a bunch of different levels from backyard, farm, and large scale operations. Uh, backyard level, again, we're just managing our wastes and uh, you could do that in many different ways. Uh, I'm gonna touch on just a few of the systems but not to go into real depth. Uh, but your know, most classic one, uh, this is a household in uh, Ithaca, New York. And you can see he just has a pile, a heap and poorly managed. Uh, it takes up a lot of space, but if we start managing it uh, a little bit better and we put it into some type of a system uh, that it's going to break down, it's going to look more neat, uh, and you reduce pests, uh, flies, all kinds of issues, uh, and certainly angry neighbors. Larger system right here. And when we're managing our compostables, you're always considering how much you produce. So at the backyard level, you can get away with small bins, uh, a little bit larger, maybe a small farm. You're gonna need something like this, uh, where it's the separate bays and you're turning it through the bays, uh, but all of them work. It's, it's, it's just, and all the management is all relatively the same that I'm gonna get into. But we go up a little bit larger uh, where you're going to have, you know, tons of waste now at any one time. And so you need uh, a tractor, a bucket loader to manage it. Your piles become a little bit larger. And so the previous two systems are no longer appropriate. They're just, it's not, um, it's not economical. It's not practical. Uh, so you go to a bucket loader and go even larger and where you're dealing with 10, tons of waste, um, you know, in one pile. Uh, maybe you're uh, going to uh, a compost turner like you see here. This is the one we have at Rodale Institute. The question on research or activities I'm conducting, um, ask that again at the end if I don't touch on it, uh, but some of it might come up because I want to make sure I have time for this, but thank you for asking. Again, why compost? Manage aerobic decomposition. That's all we're doing. At the end, it's decomposed material. And we're able to land apply it here in this manure spreader. And we're doing it with some kind of a certainty that this final material is stable organic matter. Uh, and I have some uh, chemical analyses that I'm going to show at, uh, in the middle here. Um, but 
all of the compostables that we're putting into it, and I'm gonna have some gross pictures for you coming up, all these compostables that we're putting into it, uh, we can say with some type of assurance that uh, it's stable organic matter, it's plant nutrients, and it's free of pathogens, and depending on your system, free of weed seeds. So we're doing this, but at the backyard level, these are my two daughters, uh, and I, I compost everything I'm, I, I'm capable of at my household, and we have a large garden, and this is them digging in the garden, and I feel pretty safe that they're not going to catch some gastral distress bacterium uh, causing projectile vomiting and explosive diarrhea, and so far they haven't. But that's them digging up some roots and getting their hands dirty in the compost. Lots of different things. Um, the question of what can you compost? It's easier to say what you can't and what you can't at kind of the household level or just four main things, plastic, glass, metal, and styrofoam. And that's it. The rest of it is available um, to be composted. So you can see some food slop up there at the top. There's at the farm scale, there's gonna be grasses, uh, yard debris, um, leftover vegetables, wood chips. Uh, these are pasture grasses as well, moldy hay bales. Keep going with it. You can do meats. Um, you can do municipal biosolids. It's not permitted in, uh, in organics, of course, but you can do that. Uh, there are human manure systems out there and it's just, you know, a type of manure. <clears throat> you could do mortality composting. Uh, that's me setting up there with um, one of our deceased uh, sheep there, or I mean goats. And so that's a whole nother topic uh, when trying to do uh, these sensitive compostables. But essentially at the end of the day, it's waste management and turning what somebody else considers waste into a resource for plant production. So you got to take both parts when we're talking about composting. It's not just using the end result. It's how we manage all those materials to create that end result, that valuable soil amendment. All right, so what I'm changing subjects here, this is also more of why compost is the um, solid waste by the numbers. And so uh, if I pause for a little bit, it's because I'm moving my Q&A box around. But uh, what you're looking at here is EPA puts out uh, every three to five years a fact sheet on uh, sustainable materials management, basically solid waste generation in the United States. And what I mean by solid waste is the stuff we put to the curb. That's everything, the recyclables and the trash. Everything that you put to the curb, that's considered solid waste. Everything else that goes down the drain, that's a different type of waste and that's not considered in this fact sheet. And there is an updated fact sheet, this isn't it, but if you go to EPA and you uh, try Googling um, this right there, uh, the Advancing Sustainable Materials Management, you could find this. It's got a lot of information, a lot of easy to read information. Uh, I'm going to go through a few of the figures that they produce in there. And I find it to be a very telling uh, story when it comes to why compost. So just in general, waste management in the United States is showing that um, if you're a betting man, you would bet on waste. You would bet on waste management in any form that it is because it's going up and it hasn't slowed over the since in you know, last 40 or last 60 years 60, 70, 80 years. Um, and when we're looking at the orange line, that's gonna be per capita. And so what that's saying is the average US citizen is producing 4.4 pounds of solid waste per day. Here is the recycling rate. Uh, it's pretty nice to see that's going up. The percentage of recycling is about 35%. But in the United States, that's, it's at 35. In European countries, it's above 60 most of the time. So we have a lot of work to do there, but it is nice to see that um, the materials are going up.
And if we had to just take an overview of what solid waste looks like, this pie chart is basically, you could put anything kind of, it says percentage, per percent of effort, percent of money, um, anything you want to say, that's basically what solid waste management looks like. And greater than half of it, we just take those materials and landfill them. And that's the only time that these materials are considered wastes. If we have to think about it, you can't get anything else out of it. We can recycle it, we can compost it, we can reuse it, um, we can refurbish it, anything you wanna do with uh, repurposing, um, that's the only time once it gets into a landfill, it's considered a waste material. I'm gonna read this question out. Uh, at larger composting facilities run by municipalities, I've heard that some are considering using sewage sludge that have been processed by heat. Um, with the proliferation of PFOVs in our environment, especially water, should we be concerned? You should always be concerned because those are persistent chemicals when it comes to PFOVs. And part of the um, regulation on sewage sludge is it's difficult to de define um, in some ways because we don't know all the different chemicals we put into our body. If you were doing this at home, you know everything. Um, and I will say sewage sludge is permitted in conventional ag on fields that are not used for human uh, food. So it is concerned because this stuff can make its way into our, our, um, our rivers and streams. All right, two really nice figures here. All right, so we have total waste management or total waste generation in the United States broken down into the different categories. And the only ones I wanna focus in on are the food and yard trimmings. It's about 28% of what we um, throw away into our trash can is food and yard trimmings. Two items that are easily compostable in any backyard composting system. Of that material, we get, um, we recover only 2% of the food and a large portion of the yard trimmings, only about a quarter of it though, um, probably because of mandates of uh, certain municipalities not permitting yard debris in their, in their trash. But you see that we are throwing a significant amount of food waste into the, into the landfill. 98% of what we generate in waste of, of this 15% here goes to the landfill. And what does that look like in the landfill? Right here, this is, this is the contents of the average US landfill. And what is very staggering is why compost is 22% of landfills are food waste. And the most recent number I think grew to 23 or 24% of our landfills, nearly a quarter of our landfills are food waste. This is where I always get fired up and say, how do you feed 9.5 billion people in the world? stop wasting food. I mean, look at how much is, is just making its way to the landfill. And it's uh, and somebody who's been in waste management for a while now, I can understand every part of our life, there's waste generated into it, especially in agriculture. When you buy too many seeds, you overplant, you do, do not harvest, or you harvest and there's processing waste, or there's delivery wastes, or stuff that goes bad once it gets to wherever it needs to go. And then it goes to a restaurant, only a portion of that gets eaten, gets thrown away. Or even maybe you want to do a good thing and you want to take it home with you, put it in a doggy bag. But let's be honest, most of the time you let that sit into your sit in your fridge for about three days and throw it away anyway. So I'm going to get off of that now, change subjects, um, but keep in mind how much waste we're doing and ask yourself, why compost? Does the compost change the pH? I have stuff for, to answer that coming up in uh, chemical characteristics. All right, basics of composting. You have your organic matter. These are your compostables and oxygen and water. That's all you're adding. Microorganisms that are inhabiting some of those, some of that organic matter, they are turning it into carbon dioxide, stable organic matter, water, and heat. Heat is lost in that system. Let's see if it comes up. Heat is lost in that system just because of microbial activities. Much like anybody going to a, a gym and you're working out, you're getting hot, you're feeling warm, you're sweating. 
same thing, but on the billions of billions and billions of microbes in a compost pile. All right, the elements of a compost pile. And this is, again, at any scale from backyard to large scale. Um, this is what I'm looking at. And this, these are the ingredients I'm managing that compost pile. It's not how many leaves there are. It's not how much um, tomato waste from making sauce is in there. Or it's these, this acronym, WONK, which is water, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Okay, that's all I'm looking at and I'm focusing on. And you have to be a pretty seasoned composter to be able to picture that in just those four elements. And so when I'm looking at this pile here, how do I manage that? I'm breaking it down into its basic elements. Uh, how much water is there? How much carbon is there? How much oxygen is there? And how much nitrogen is there? And with those elements, they are either uh, directly or inversely related to each other. So water and oxygen, if you have too much water in your system or in your pile, it's going to fill up pore spaces and you're going to push out the oxygen. Likewise, if too, there's too much nit nitrogen or nitrogenous materials, you're going to have less carbon in there as well. Um, the nitrogen materials, they are we typically referred to them as greens, carbon materials as browns. Your uh, carbon materials are typically dry, brittle, Material doesn't have to be brown like straw. Uh, nitrogenous materials don't have to be green. They just have a higher nit nitrogen content than uh, a relative nitrogen content than carbon. Everything, even leaves, have a carbon to nitrogen ratio. But if something has a higher nitrogen ratio, it's going to have a, typically have a higher water content. Likewise with carbon, and this is where they're direct related. The more carbon you have, the more oxygen you have. So the more leaves or straw you have in your pile, the more oxygen you're going to have in a pile. So you have to manage all of these when you're building a compost pile and you're maintaining it throughout the season. Five elements for backyard composting. So if I was just doing a backyard only composting presentation, this is, this is the slide that you want to stay awake for. First. There's no one right way to compost. There are many bad ways, but no one right way. Everybody could be doing it a little different and still achieve the same goal. Number two, no food showing. This is gonna avoid a lot of the problems that most people discuss when it comes to troubleshooting. Uh, there's pests or there's uh, flies or um, animals coming in, critters and angry neighbors and odors. Um, you could avoid a lot of that with no food showing. How do we do that? It's through lasagna layering. And that's a technique I I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, and I have a nice image to show you what that looks like. Embrace balance and remedy imbalance. And that's the balance in your uh, wonk, your carbon, uh, nitrogen, water, and oxygen. Um, the balance of uh, all of these elements going in there. When it works, you got to embrace it. Uh, when it's not working and some of that are signs of odors or something going wrong, you got to remedy it. Diversity reigns and uniformity pains. Uh, when this, this is in many different ways of saying diversity, diversity of your particle sizes. Uh, so you don't want to chop everything down to the same size. It doesn't work in a, in a composting system, especially backyard system. So if you ask me, should I shred my leaves? No, because then you're just putting them into a uniform size. Having a diversity in, in structure and pile porosity, uh, it's going to go a long way in your compost pile. Diversity in your starting materials as well. So if you are somebody who has coffee all day long and you have a lot of coffee grinds, you don't want just coffee grinds into your compost pile. You want to mix it up. And that's going to give you a diversity in microorganisms and nutrients at the end of the day. I said lasagna layering. Uh, this is what a backyard pile is going to look like uh, if you're doing it, if you're managing it correctly. Uh, so you start with your brown layer here, and that stick, that stalky coarse material uh, could be just a pallet on the ground, like you, uh, if you recall the one of the early slides of backyard system. 
Uh, you could just do a pallet. If you don't want to use a pallet, a bunch of sticks that are just lifting the whole pile off the, the ground. Uh, and then you give yourself a generous layer of browns. Um, in um, the Northeast, we have plenty of leaves. Uh, so you create a six inch layer of leaves, but form it into a nest. You can see the sides are a little bit higher than the middle. And then you dump your greens in there, your food waste or whatever it is. And you dump that into the center of the pile and cover with another layer of browns. And so that no food is showing. You can see on the outsides of, uh, this is a welded wire pile, an image of what a welded wire pile looks like. There's probably a good four to six inches of leaves on the outside. And by doing this, you avoid odors for one thing. And if there's no odors, you are less likely to attract uh, pests and critters, uh, as well as some of the, the uh, flies. A lot of these animals, or a lot of these insects, I should say, um, they require the surface of whatever material they want. They require that to be exposed. So they're not, a fruit fly is not going to bury itself looking for it. And there's that image uh, that I mentioned uh, of a welded wire bin and no food showing, but inside there is some really nasty stuff. There's a nasty food snot that is going in there. And we have a high traffic area of, of people walking by this. Uh, and I can ensure that uh, making doing the lasagna layering that we're gonna avoid a lot of the odors. It doesn't have to, you see separate layers of straw and leaves. That's just the materials I had at the time. So it could be all leaves. It's not layering um, your browns, different brown layers. It's not, it's not like that. It's just the materials I had at the time. I like to use a palette. It defines the area, keeps things nice and neat, uh, rather than just having it on the ground. Um, and they're readily available. And typically you want your pile to be three foot in diameter. We'll read this comment real quick. We have too high a percent of oak leaves and pine needles mulching. At least some of these is key. Uh, so agree with diversity of particle size. Um, yeah, the, um, the oak leaves, I, I, I've never had too much of a problem with those. Pine needles, for sure, they're just going to take a long time to break down, no matter chopping them up. Chopping is going to help, uh, but if you make them too fine, they're going to start filling in pore spaces and eventually push out some oxygen. Um, crumbling ground eggshells, good techniques. I agree with that. Um, the only thing I would comment on is, uh, is how much effort you're putting into all that. I want to do the least amount of effort in my backyard as possible. I have three children. I'd rather spend time with them, or at least until they're older, make them do the composting, uh, and then they could do all the effort, so I don't have to. But it's more of uh, how much effort you're putting in there. Different scales, uh, slightly larger, the same thing. Uh, in this system, uh, no food showing as well. You can't just dump and run. You're more likely to attract mice and rats and you know larger critters into this one than the welded wire and a smaller system. So you just got to be careful with that. Okay, um, getting into stages of composting now. We have a pile. We started building. What are we to expect? Um, this is your classic time temperature compost uh, profile. And uh, so when you're putting your materials together, it's going to be the mesophilic stage. And then quickly the microbes go into action. They start breaking things down and it starts heating up. And then as resources become limited, uh, you get your cooling stage. And then eventually you move on to the curing stage. And that's the time right at the end when you really want to use it. You don't want to use your material until it reaches curing. And how do you know when that's finished? It's, it doesn't have any smells. You can't recognize any of the starting materials. Um, it's dry, crumbly, kind of resembles earth. Um, okay. But I'm going to get to a couple of these questions in just a minute after I go through recording temperatures. Uh, so this is me recording temperatures at a large scale. I still record temperatures. Uh, the temperature is telling me how the compost is is progressing, how things are breaking down. In a backyard setting, you're not likely to get very high temperatures. Maybe in the summer, 
but you're adding small amounts, uh, not very often. And so it just doesn't have the volume to heat up, the, the microbial capacity. But at a large scale, I can reach temperatures of 160 degrees within a couple of days. So you're seeing the time frame in three months down at the bottom here. And these are just two different piles. And you're seeing two different lines. Uh, one line is an average of the top three um, locations. And then the other line is the average of the bottom three, just to show that there are different locations in a pile that are going to respond uh, differently when it comes to composting temperatures. And I'll say that, let me make sure, let me check what is coming up next. Yeah, so recording temperatures and composting during the winter. This is again at the large scale. I was able to achieve 150 degrees here in just a few days of composting and put my piles together, but you get a, a very cold snap, you get a snowstorm. And at that point, uh, in, at the large scale, I have, you know, it, 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 I don't need to just keep going at it with my equipment. So I paused and every one of these dots is a turning event, uh, just to show you, actually, no, just the, the white dots is when I turn it. So we go through, these are the average temperatures of all six locations in the pile that I'm measuring. And then I come about of get into the end of March, just like I would in my backyard, beginning of April, right around this time. I want to get outside. It's a beautiful day out today. And I want to turn my pile. I turn it. That's what this white dot represents. And boom, temperature goes right back. It's ready to rock and roll again. And then you go through that process. So what also both of this slide and the last slide are showing is a repeated the the time temperature graph being repeated over time. So it's going up and down. That's because when I turn it, I'm exposing new surfaces to decomposition. And so that's what you're seeing in reality when it comes to composting, even in your backyard. It's not just gonna do that one uh, process of going through the mesophilic, thermophilic. You're gonna be repeating that over and over. Okay, let's see if I can get to just some of these questions. Uh, could you add biochar to your compost or should you just add it directly into your soil? Uh, if you're paying for biochar, I wouldn't add it and dilute it into your compost. Uh, most people I talk to, they either make it themselves or they're buying it. And it's in such small quantities, I would always use it in directly into the soil and try to mix it in that way. Instead of, it, it's a little less known um, just because of the nature of biochar, it's uh, diverse in its definition and, and how it's produced. It's less known how it's behaving in a compost pile. Electric composters to grind meats, uh, which may attract the animals and then add to outdoor compost. Um, I'm not sure what uh, electric composters to grind meats. I'm not familiar with those. I am an avid hunter. I put my butcher waste directly into my backyard bin and within a one year time that stuff breaks down of course i still have the bones but it all breaks down um and to a level where the kids go ahead and play in the boneyard does the metal silo on the wooden pallet have a metal floor no and i'm not quite sure uh if i didn't see a metal but there's no floor it's just a pallet so because it's just all wood you do have to replace that pallet every few years, say three to five years. All right, so from the, oh, sorry. Managing compostables from the kitchen to the compost pile. All right, this is how I first started doing it. I've advanced since then, but the process still hasn't changed. Um, what you're looking at is all the tools I need Minus just a couple of how I manage my backyard composting. Uh, so to start, I have a small container right here, a quart size container. At that time, it was just my wife and I. Uh, we've grown with our kids to more of a gallon and a half container, but that's right at our kitchen sink. It's readily available, easy to get to, easy to open, um, easy to clean. That's there. When that fills, and for my household, it's well, it's less than once a week. Um, I have a five gallon, I could choose to go all the way out to my compost pile. And if it's raining, I have to do that. Or if there's a lot of snow, you'd have to do that. 
but I want to reduce how much effort. So out my back door, that's very close, even in rain or snow, um, I have a five gallon bucket. Uh, and so I start filling that up with the kitchen bucket. When that gets full, you can choose to go out to your compost pile. Again, I'm trying to tell you how lazy I want to be with this and be honest with you. I got a second five gallon bucket and I started growing. How many, how many trips do I want to make to my compost pile? Uh, and then the uh, when those two buckets get full, you can choose to go to another, uh, go take all of that out uh, to your compost pile and you do your lasagna layering and that would be all one layer. Or again, you could be a little lazy and give yourself another month or so of, of less work at the compost pile. So I have a third one and there's not going to be a fourth. I didn't know if you knew where that was going. Uh, only because there is a total of four buckets, my kitchen one with a handle and two of the five gallon buckets that I could handle with one hand. And so I take that out to my active compost bin. Um, here's a leaf bin in the, the just the homemade bin plus leaves in my um, trash can there. It's very helpful to keep your leaves dry, especially in the winter or when it's raining. It's just difficult to work with frozen leaves. And so I add them into my, uh, my compost bin. I do my layering, no food showing. And if I need to add leaves as I'm putting it in there, because yes, after about two months of having that stuff sit out during the summer, it's going to turn really nasty. I'm not going to lie about that. But if you just move quickly, it's not going to smell after five minutes of dumping it into your compost pile. Make sure you keep it covered. Um, I have gone to um, two welded wire bins now. Uh, one's active. That's where I'm always doing my lasagna layering. Uh, and this is my process of doing this for, uh, from year to year. Uh, and then I have my passive compost bin. And so if you can imagine these two bins here, one's active, the smaller one's going to be passive. So come this time of year when I want to get out and start working in my garden and turn my compost, I turn all of the contents of that bin into my passive bin and let that sit for another year. Uh, reason I do that is because if you just have one bin, uh, when you're going to turn it, you have to play name that food, and is it done yet? Uh, and I got tired of playing those games. So without thinking, I take all the contents and the top stuff I might have added just a couple days ago. So I have to relayer it into the top or into the bottom. And the stuff at the bottom, certainly half of it, half a year's worth, uh, that's finished but I didn't want to have to work through all that. I just dump it in there after uh, two years then. Um, it's completely finished, the entire thing, except for some of the more woodier uh, and uh, recalcitrant materials. Rodent problems. Uh, in this setting, yes, you could have rodent problems You're closer to the cities. And if your neighbors have compost piles, um, I, I do, they had rodent problems. Um, that uh, because they did dump and runs uh, where they didn't manage it, didn't lasagna layer. Uh, to get rid of rodent problems, you make a hostile environment, you stab it with whatever you have, a pitchfork or whatever. And um, yeah, that, that, that works. And so in my backyard now, um, suburbs, I, I don't have any rodent problems except voles. Voles are very common, but they're not a problem and they, they stay pretty well hidden. Are you producing anaerobic decomposition if in a sealed bucket? Uh, that's one thing, good question. I don't seal it. I keep the lid just lightly on it so that it can still breathe. Great question, um, but that doesn't mean it's not smelling because all that liquid in there, it's still gonna go anaerobic. But when you put it into the compost pile, you mix in some of the brown material, the carbon material, you bring it back to a aerobic condition. What's happening in your compost pile? Um, throughout the year, as long as you don't smell it, I don't think there's gonna, there, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, painted wood slats around the bin, that was just materials. And this is honestly uh, me just becoming a master composter. And so I didn't wanna go out and buy another welded wire bin. That's just me using cheap material that I found around. Um, are you concerned about the paint chipping into the compost? Not really. Um, it's going into your yard, into your, your backyard, just from chipping off, you know, wherever that wood chip came from. Of course, I don't like it, uh, but that's why I go to welded wire bins. 
And I will say for those who are looking to purchase, the two by four is the most economical, it comes in different heights and you need about 12 feet. If you want two of the bins, get with a 25 foot roll and cut it in half. Larger scale, managing compostables, you still have your, um, you know, your different pile types, uh, woody material that's gonna be uh, chipped. Uh, you have your slop and some of your green material that you have to manage and prevent any kind of leachate and excess water and uh, flies and odors. And then you keep a layer, uh, you keep a nice healthy stockpile of, of leaves. This is one of the local municipalities here dropping off leaves. I only get leaves uh, one time of the year in the fall. Uh, and so you have to stockpile them all year, just like you have to do it in your backyard. Uh, the equipment, I'm going to run through this pretty easily. Uh, you have, if you need a hose, I don't need to water my compost because I manage the water and oxygen pretty well through how many, how much nitrogen or the greens and browns I put in there. Uh, these are some uh, uh, students here at Rodale that are learning to compost uh, and they're, they're layering it up here. Uh, but pitchfork, you see the pitchforks at the backyard scale, maybe some shovels, that's all you need. Um, I mean, you're not turning the compost in the welded wire bin. All right, going back to the turning, uh, because it does apply to what equipment you're using with a pitchfork. Um, I'm not turning it when it's in the bin until March or April. Uh, so I only turn it once. A lot of my audience at my workshop have been older individuals, uh, they, you know, backyard people, landscapers, and it would be disingenuous of me to say that you have to turn compost. You know, a full compost bin, even in a welded wire, is going to weigh a lot. There's a lot of material in there, and it gets compacted over time because you keep adding to it, and it's a lot of work. I did it for several years. And so I started just doing it a little bit less and realizing I'm getting the same goal until I went to that two year system. In the first year, there's a lag where you don't get finished material, but every year after that you do. And so I, I'm able to just turn it once a year and then it goes out into my backyard, uh, into my garden. You can use brown cardboard if uh, taped, removed and not shiny. Absolutely, you can use brown cardboard, but when it comes to paper and cardboard, you um, you increase the life of that material uh, because it can be recycled and turned into other paper products. Uh, using cardboard in your backyard setting um, can cause air, not air gaps, but it can prevent air movement because it's just flat. And if you spend the time shredding it, that would work, but um, I would recycle it if you could. Larger scale. You know, this is a dairy operation. You're now at a skid steer or some kind of a bucket loader and you're getting a manure spreader most likely. You go bigger, yeah, bucket loader here and manure spreader. Uh, and then you have at a large scale, you're getting into the compost turner and they come in many different sizes and shapes. All right, uh, the chemical characteristics, excuse me. Um, I just want to make a very, um, oh, let me go back to the turning because I don't want to miss that one. But with the welded wire bin to fasten it together, you could use twist ties or cut the wire in a certain way that you leave uh, parts of the wire hanging over that can bend back on itself. And then you just open it up and it'll remain the column there. Um, uh, the question again, the cardboard, I think I answered that one, but uh, that's how you turn it in a wire bin. You open the whole thing up and then you have your other uh, passive bin closed. How small of pieces? Uh, too small that uh, you wouldn't want to do it. Uh, I'm going to say shredded, shredded cardboard. You can get away with anything, but if you prevent oxygen from moving by adding cardboard, then you run into air, anaerobic conditions and uh, potential for generating odors. All right, the th big thing about compost, it is not a fertilizer. Um, it should never be considered or compared to fertilizers. Uh, miracle Grow and Scott's, you know, 15, 30, 15, compost doesn't compare to that. Uh, a Rick's compost is only like 1.61 at best. And let me see what I have here, yes. Uh, ignore the top half of that. 
But the bottom half, this is a, um, <clears throat> right here's my NPK of 36 different compost piles. That's the average in mine. And so this is a typical Penn State University um, compost test. And this is what you get out of it. Uh, so you can see all the things down here. This is as is basis and the units. And you will be able to go back at this. So I'm not gonna go too much into it. Organic matter is certainly one of the most valuable things in a compost pile. Uh, about 23%. Total nitrogen, like I said, it's 1.2. Uh, pH, does it change? Does the pH change? pH has a buffering capacity. And I do think I show pH over time in a co uh, compost pile. Um, so average compost is going to be around 7.7 .7 pH. And the key thing is that if you're making and using cured compost, the um, Finished material is going to have a very low variability. Uh, so pH being right here, and this is, I think it says standard deviation at the top. It's basically the plus and minus. Uh, so pH of 7.7 .7 plus or minus 0 0.4. And again, you're looking at some of these other elements like total nitrogen, uh, 1.6 plus or minus 0.4. Uh, and then what Scott's Miracle Grow do doesn't have is um, all these other micronutrients. And the last number I, I read for uh, essential nutrients for growth, plant growth and reproduction is 17. And so when you buy fertilizer, you're only getting three of them. Compost can su uh, supply the others, maybe in varying quantities, but at least it's there. Suggestions for composting in bare country. Uh, a cage. Uh, I, I haven't ever tried it, uh, so I, I don't want to get into what I think uh, just one individual. Um, horse manure. Uh, you can. You have to know where that's coming from. Uh, there are persistent herbicides that have been reported, reportedly used in horse farms. Um, these are like uh, clopyrrolid or aminopyrrolid or some other deliver, uh, um um, derivatives of copyrolid, uh, and they have the ability to uh, get sprayed in the field. They're a broadleaf herbicide, get sprayed in the field. They persist into either the, the hay or the horse eats it, persists into the manure, persists through the composting process, and then you buy that compost, and that um, herbicide is still active. And so there are a lot of um, reports of that, and if you Google persistent herbicides, I think one of the first ones was in the late 1990s, early 2000s in Spokane County, Washington. And that's when we first started getting uh, warnings of it. Branches breaking down to smaller products, they're tough. Um, even with the large tractor turner, what are some of the manufacturer names? Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Um, it's too many for me to name. They have large branches. Um, they're just, they take a long time. All right, more of the... Chemical, it's the organic matter. So here's pH over time. This is some of the chemical characteristics. There, right here's your time temperature figure uh, with pH and then the carbon and nitrogen. So when you're adding a lot of your nitrogenous materials, it's gonna have a lower pH, uh, more acidic, but over time with the carbon uh, and the organic matter, the stable organic matter, uh, you're raising your pH. And again, it's gonna be close to eight. Uh, just to show that was, you know, a hand-drawn one. Uh, these are, this is a study that was looking at the physical, chemical, and microbial, microbial parameters uh, using minisole sewage sludge, so human waste. And you see that in the different uh, lines are just different compost piles. And so in the composting time and weeks, again, that's showing the same thing. You're getting between seven and eight. All right, so uh, getting into biological characteristics, this is a little bit more difficult to define and understand, uh, so I won't have too many slides, uh, but I'd be curious to see some of the questions after I go through them. Um, I like to use these figures because uh, these time temperature figures, because your compost pile is changing chemically, biologically, and physically over time. So at point one or day one and compared to day 10, everything about it could be a little bit different. Uh, either what microbes are there and most active 
um, to the chemical changes. Uh, so what this is showing is the large groups of, of active microbes in a compost pile being bacteria, uh, actinomycetes, which is multicellular and, and fungal-like bacteria, and fungi. Uh, fungi, I will just say, they don't like the high temperatures. Uh, so they don't persist uh, and become more active until the cooling stage. And at that point, they're going after the woody materials. Actinomycetes, also known, uh, very active in forest floors. Um, so they're present throughout the whole pile. Uh, but the ones that are actually surviving at those high temperatures and generating those high temperatures and are active throughout the compost pile are going to be the bacteria. You could do chemical analysis, or not chemical, you could do uh, genetic, ana ana genetic analyses uh, for your finished compost. And this is what one of them looks like. Uh, as a microbiologist, I, I have a degree from Cornell University in plant pathology. And you're basically a, micro a specialized microbiologist. And when I look at that and I think of what my compost is, that doesn't mean that much to me. And so what you're looking at is a lot of the uncultured bacterium, uh, there's stuff that isn't defined, and so we don't know what it is, we don't know what it does, uh, but you can look and start finding some of the other species uh, in, in the genus, say, Bacillus. We know some of the Bacilli bacteria. Uh, they're known for having disease-suppressive and toxin-producing uh, capabilities. But one compost, with all of its starting ingredients like horse manure versus just leaf compost, they're gonna have a different um, community of microorganisms. So when I go and say I want to test for this stuff, this is what compost testing looks like for uh, finished compost and you wanna know what back, uh, microbes are in there. This is an example of them. I get this kind of test and I still don't really understand what this is gonna do for me. It doesn't help me as a practitioner. Um, it doesn't predict what's gonna happen in the field or in my garden. Because this test is not going to tell me, except for a few of the chemical analyses that are present, like electrical conductivity, um, this isn't going to tell me how my um, compost is going to perform out in the field. Uh, the best test you can have, which I hope it comes next. Okay, it's not. The best test you're going to have is what the plant tells you. And so the plant can tell you if it's good compost or not, if it's high quality, because it's going to grow better. It's going to have less diseases. So this is uh, some of my graduate work um, studying uh, how, um, studying the mechanisms of uh, composted substrates. In this case, it was vermicompost, how it can suppress a soil-borne plant pathogen. Uh, this one's called damping off. And so there's no compost in this system right here. There's compost and protection, and both of these have the pathogen included in their growth. But um, adding compost was able to suppress the pathogen. All right, moving on to vermicompost. Uh, very, um, very difficult uh, presentation to give uh, over a webinar. Um, a lot of people love it. Um, but it is taking a dramatic turn from compost. So I want to uh, go over some of the um, similarities and differences with compost and vermicompost. Um, so you see compost and just in these two slides, uh, very simple to uh, tell. Uh, compost is heating up or it can heat up. Vermicompost doesn't. And it's produced through the activities and um, digestion of earthworms. What is compost? Manage aerobic decomposition using microbes. Vermicompost is earthworm digestion and decomposition using, using the activities of micro and macro organisms at room temperatures. So you don't have many, there are macro organisms in a compost pile, uh, but certainly not when it's hot. Uh, but in a vermicompost bin uh, or pile, depending on how you're managing it, uh, you do have um, healthy community of micro, macroorganisms. The earthworms can't do it themselves. And in fact, they feed on the uh, biofilms caused by the micro and macroorganisms. 
Uh, great slide to show the differences. Uh, again, compost hot, uh, vermicompost moderate or mesophilic. Uh, shows the predominant organisms. Uh, your C to N ratio here, and you guys could review that. I want to make sure I can get through the slides, but this will be available for you. pH is going to be slightly different. Um, both have high microorganisms, uh, low macroorganisms and compost. Volume restrictions, uh, that gets these last two lines are some of the bigger differences. You can only add so much to a vermicompost pile or a vermicompost bin, however you're, you're doing that. And then the total nitrogen, and I should just say the chemical composition is going to be higher in a vermicompost, uh, vermicompost system. Um, so it's more potent is another way to put that. Helping, yeah, I'll go back to my waste management. If we could divert, uh, the, the question is, what role does composting have in help, helping fight global warming and climate change? When I do a, a larger backyard compost, um, I do mention that. Um, uh, backyard compost workshop, I do mention that in, in the role, and I'll briefly just say it right now. Um, you put these organic residuals, um, all your food waste into a uh, landfill. The landfills break down anaerobically, producing methane. You put it into a compost bin and you manage it, it's going to break down uh, aerobically and produce CO2. We know, clearly know, methane is uh, higher, uh, has the higher capacity to, um, you know, increase temperature and, uh, and, and uh, cause climate change and, and global warming. Uh, just real quick on earthworm biology, kind of fun topic here. Um, the types of worms first, uh, these were a bunch that you can use, uh, but really what you're sticking to are the Asinias. If you're ever going to buy uh, earthworms, uh, you're buying red wigglers. Um, even as experts, it's hard to tell the difference between some of these true red worms, uh, Lumbricus and the Asinia, Asinias. Uh, but you want these because they're epigeic, meaning that they feed on the surface of, uh, they feed on the surface either in their tropical species. Um, whereas our night crawlers that we have in the Northeast, we do have other ones, um, but um, you see the giant night crawlers, uh, those are territorial and they cause burrows. So they hibernate over the winter. They go down below the frost line and hibernate. Whereas the Asinias, they're colonial and they don't hibernate. So that's why you, we choose those for a vermicomposting system. Internal anatomy, um, real quick, let's see if somebody can get this before the end. What happens when you cut a earthworm in half? I'll leave that question open for everybody. Um, and so it has a couple of things that are important. It has a crop and a gizzard. And what this is very similar to a bird. And so um, uh, earthworms, uh, they require some sand or particles to uh, digest or break down the food before it goes into their uh, digestive tract. Nothing there. Okay. Earthworm reproduction, uh, when you see that band on an earthworm, that's called the clitellum. It, it indicates sexual maturity. Earthworms are hermaphrodites, but uh, two are required for reprodu reproduction, and each of them donates a sperm to the other worm. Uh, worms can live, feed, and reproduce for three to four years. And so that plate there you're seeing, those are cocoons of earthworms, and um, those little brown structures there, uh, lots of cocoons there. In, in each cocoon, you can get about one to three worms. Let's see. Uh, reproduction, uh, it's important because you're managing a bin and those are your workers. Uh, the more workers you have, the more output you can have. You get two, two to four eggs per cocoon. Uh, they can survive months to years. A cocoon to, ha a cocoon to hatching is about four to six weeks. A juvenile emergence, from down the soil, the cocoons are laid down further deeper. Uh, you will find them on the surface, but as you're feeding a bin, they become buried. So uh, emergence to maturity is six to eight weeks. 
A mature worm can release uh, two to three cocoons per week. And so what you're seeing here, um, that's the timeline, and that's under the most ideal conditions, but you can double your worm bin population about every two months. Okay, let's see if anybody got it right. What role, okay, got, it regenerates. When you cut an earthworm in half, uh, you now have two earthworms. No, you have two dead worms. Uh, a worm's uh, nervous system and digestive system do not grow back. Just like if I cut you in half, it won't grow back. That's a common miss, uh, it's a common thing that people always think of, and no, it doesn't regenerate. Now, it might look like it's living uh, when you cut a worm in half and it's bouncing all around. It's because it's in terrible pain. So I'm not going to advocate giving it a shot, but you can learn for yourself. Lifespan of the worm, it's difficult to tell. I never put a monitor or a tracker on it, but uh, the reports that I've read are months to years. Yeah, and I mentioned that under the ideal conditions, uh, you can get a double every uh, two months or so, uh, but re reproduction times uh, and growth rates depend on the environmental conditions. Different systems, and um, when it comes to vermicomposting, uh, so um, plastic totes, homemade tote bins here, and you can see it's a tote within a tote. I'll explain why. Um, and there's just, just a single tote. Uh, these are uh, compo com compact composters uh, that they're stackable. So there's multiple uh, size. These are about a gallon container. Styrofoam bin. This looks like a cedar bin, but I suspect it's not. But it's a wooden bin that's stacked up on itself. You shouldn't use Caesar, cedar. It's uh, antimicrobial. And probably the largest at-home system is this warm wigwam that you see here in the bottom right. Um, that's a, uh, a continuous flow through system, much like they would use it at the large scale, but this is just on a uh, almost a cubic yard system. And so you feed on top in all of these situations, you feed on top and then some of them you harvest off of the bottom. So that's what this is doing. Feeding on top it has a breaker bar right here that you spin, cuts an uh, inch off the bottom, open this little door and you could scoop everything out. Uh, that's the same kind of idea with the stackable ones that you keep feeding on top. Once it gets full, you put a new stack on, worms migrate to the top, and then over time you can get all the uh, finished material at the bottom. And if you're using plastic and you just, you don't have the stack hole, any plastic in, 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 for that matter, inside the worm wigwam, this is plastic, but it has a insulated jacket. So plastic bins, I constantly hear the, the trouble of plastic bins is that, and you see how they're all raised up. This one's raised up on blocks. This one's raised up by another bin. And this one has a little spout. Um, these are all telling me something, uh, that they generate a lot of water uh, during the vermicomposting process. And the reason is, is because they don't hold temperature very well. Just like uh, a Coke can in the sun, a cold Coke can that you take out to the sun sweats on the outside, plastic bins will do the same thing on the inside, and all that condensation is going to drip down along the sides, collect, and if you don't have holes in the bottom, you're going to get puddled up, and you're probably going to lose a worm bin. If they put a spout on it, they are automatically telling you that you're going to have a lot of excess leachate is what that is. It's leachate. That's not compost extract or vermicompost extract or compost tea, you don't want to use it because it's, it's partially digested material. Um, my preference is the foam styrofoam bins. Uh, you can get these at pet shops. They give them away for free a lot of times. This is how they ship fish long distances. And so they're about an inch and a half thick. I never have any sweating going on. Um, and if you are finding there's too much moisture or not enough, you could add more holes. Uh, there's some cloth taped to the top to allow it to breathe a little bit more. You can easily just tape those holes back up if you uh, are finding that the pile is getting too dry. There are holes at the bottom of every one of these, except the compact composter and probably not this one, the wooden one. I, I don't think there is, but I don't know for sure. 
name of my YouTube channel. I do not have one, but thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, cedar is antimicrobial. Uh, so you wouldn't want to use that. It's not going to be detrimental to the worms, but um, over time, the, that those properties are going to leach into the compost just because of moisture. Um, use cedar for raised beds. Okay, as far as antimicrobial, yes, I wouldn't take that and throw it in the landfill just because of that. Um, in a larger um, setting like that, that kind of stuff can leach out. Um, and um, your backyard raised bed setting uh, is more resilient than your delicate vermicomposting bin. Larger scale systems. Uh, two systems I work with. Um, one of them is in Argentina there. That's my wife at the background. Um, these are basically uh, compo uh, vermicompost bins, bays of them uh, that you uh, work feeding and they're underneath the tarps there, uh, feeding, watering, and it has excess moisture, can run off the sides and then gather in um, froths. Uh, but we're still managing it the same way, still using the same words. We're just getting a larger amount and harvesting is now with skid steer. Uh, the other system is warm power. I'm pretty sure it's still in existence, but that was my industry collaborator uh, during my graduate career. Uh, this was the largest compo uh, vermicomposting operation in North America or the Western Hemisphere. Um, and they have grown 800% since then. So just three bays uh to like 16 i don't recall the number but that's that's engineering that's biological engineering at its greatest with temperature settings uh moisture settings and one person operates all that with a mechanical feeding mechanical harvesting mechanical screening so that's vermicomposting at its greatest harvesting there's many different ways to harvest. Uh, this is one of the ways that I, I, the first way I learned and I've tried a little bit of everything and I go back to this one. It seems to be the quickest and I get to, now when I do it with my kids, it's kind of fun because they get to dig around in it. So what you do is basically you take your warm bin and you can see a bunch of styrofoam bins. I wasn't kidding, I prefer that. I've used um, most of them already and, and do prefer that type. Um, and then you do it, well, you scrape off all the stuff. There's a lot of, um, of newspaper that you're putting into your worm bin to manage moisture and uh, prevent fruit flies. You're keeping that at the surface, uh, putting the newspaper in there. Uh, so you can pull all that and any uh, undigested material, you pull all that up. And so that's probably what this little pile is. And then the rest of it, you dump. And you're doing this either over some type of light source, some heated light source, or outside in the sun on a tarp, and you make a bunch of little uh, like little domes. And worms don't like light. Um, they don't like light, so they're gonna uh, move their way into the middle of the pot, middle of the dome. And you wait a little bit, and you come back, and you scrape off the sides. And until you get to worms again, um, you stop, uh, and then you're free of worms uh, in that little pile that you scraped off. And then when it's all finished, and here's a bunch of domes here um, that I did when I was trying different methods for harvesting at a larger scale. Uh, when it's all finished, I think, when it's all finished, you have a very dense pile of worms. And that's what that looks like. But let me go back one. There are other ways of doing it where you feed only on one side and you're constantly harvesting on the back end. Um, that requires worms to migrate and I don't think worms are that smart or at least they don't do it fast enough to migrate where you want them to go uh, but I've tried it um, and so people say you could feed on half the bin uh, even in in your worm bin at, at home I don't find that really works I still find worms throughout my bin uh, but give it a shot uh, I've also tried putting a mesh screen down and you feed a little bit on top of it and you can see all the worms on top of the mesh screen that I could pull up and, and then dump those worms back onto the top. Um, basically what you wanna do is, is separate the worms, your workers from the finished material.
uh, technique for harvesting without removing too many cocoons. I don't have anything. Um, you're going to get rid of cocoons. So you, you set your bin back as far as reproduction wise. Um, it's just too difficult. You saw that little plate, uh, if you recall, they're the size of a match head. And there's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of them in your bin. Uh, so you do set it back a little bit. But as long as you're keeping the worms, uh, it'll have time to bounce back. Good question. Okay. Uses. I think I'm finishing up here. Um, and I, I don't want to go into all the nitty gritty of, you know, tomatoes require X, Y, and Z of compost or vermicompost. And here's where I'm talking about uh, both compost and vermicompost. I'm just going to tell you some of the key points. And one of them is that you can over apply these materials. And so I get that question all the time when I'm doing workshops is how much compost should I use? Well, I have no clue what their compost is like. I have no clue how it's prepared. Uh, so I have to be cognizant of that and give them a very uh, conservative answer. And that answer is based on some of the activities and the bioassays that I've tried either in my backyard or in a laboratory. Uh, so here's just in my backyard, testing this out for myself. This is compost amended sand. So uh, sand, that's 100% sand. So it's inert. It's not going to provide any nutrients except for the water I give it. Uh, and then I do different rates of compost, 10%. And this is all by volume. It's easy to measure volume um, rather than weight because compost has different uh, moisture uh, contents. And then you see 10%, 25, 50, 75, and 100%. And in research, we, we often do things in threes or fours in replicates. Uh, and you can see in the one replicate, it prevent, prevented germination. Um, when we look at that at a different angle, you can see that here at the side angle. Um, and take note of the observation here, the weather, weather conditions. This is three days after that last picture. Uh, and we had uh, a lot of heat and dryness. And they're in small pots. This is during the middle of the summer in New York. And they suffered. So in one picture, you might say 50 to 75 or uh, 10 to 25, I'm sorry. Uh, but in this one, we're going to say 50%. Doing a 50-50, it seems to be pretty safest. Uh, even though I had some uh, tall plants, looks like I have tall plants in 100%, one of my replicates failed. And um, the 10%, it looked good in that previous picture, so did 25%. Um, one of the benefits of compost is its water holding capacity, and that's what you're seeing in the 50% and 75. Again, I get this classic bell-shaped curve. Uh, this is with oats, I believe. And so I'm uh, doing the different rates here. And um, you see, and this in, in soilless media, so like a pro mix or something. So the ProMix is already coming with its uh, nutrients for growing seedlings um, and germinating seed, but a little bit of compost, 50 here, you can see a noticeable difference in the 50 and 75, but even in the 100% is still uh, damaging to, uh, so that's 100% compost. And this is compost that was made at Rodale. Um, so when they asked me what they should amend their compost, um, what we do at Rodale with our soilless medium, is 60% uh, um, potting mix, 40% compost. Here's what it's looking down at the seed level if you add too much. This isn't compost or vermicompost, but this is uh, compost mixed with water or vermicompost to be exact mixed with water, uh, making compost teas. And um, I try to emphasize this as well. Um, you can be, you could damage and prevent germination if you, if your material is too strong, if your liquid material is too strong, or even your solid materials, you're using too much of it. So you have reduced significantly shorter radical growth in this one to five mixture, one part uh, compost or vermicompost, as you say. Um, and five parts water, and then you get some staining in the one to 30, and then you see no difference uh, in, in root length between the one to 30, one to 60 in water. Okay.
NVE, or um, I think you meant to say N, uh, NEV, but NVE, it's non-aerated vermicompost extract. Thanks for asking. Um, and uh, so it's just uh, another way of making uh, these extracts. There's two types, aerated and non-aerated. Uh, so this is non-aerated vermicompost extract. Larger scale, even if I was using solid materials, but this is uh, liquid applications of it. Um, taking recommendations of a recipe somebody asked me to do, and this is in Argentina, and it smelled horrible while spraying. And sure enough, uh, you know, uh, on a sunny day, it burned the plants. So that's the that's the last thing you want to do is damage plants trying to do a beneficial thing. All right, I think I did pretty good on time. What do you think, Brian, Julie? But uh, we still have time for more questions. If there's something I didn't cover that I missed, uh, I'd be happy to answer them now. Great. Thank you, Rick. That was wonderful. The topic of compost is very, very dear to my heart. So I would really enjoyed your talk and I learned a lot. Maybe this would be a good time to issue a blanket apology to everyone that I have ever stared at in horror and said, you're going to throw that in the trash? Give me that. I'll take it home to my compost box. <laughs> So first of all, I wanna thank you, Rick, for a wonderful talk thank and thank everyone for being here tonight. So you will in a couple of days be receiving a follow-up email that will have a link to the video for tonight's um, presentation, as well as a link to the Rodale website and other resources that you might find interesting. And then in a couple of weeks, we're also gonna send out a follow-up email because this is our last webinar of the season. So we wanna, get back in touch with everyone who's registered for any of our webinars and send you a short survey to ask what you thought of our, our programs. And if you have any ideas for next year or future topics that we could cover in webinars. So keep your eyes open for those follow-up emails. So I think we did a pretty good job with the Q&A. Do you wanna just scan back through this? No, they, they're still coming in. It's pretty nice okay. to see. Um, so somebody's saying, if you're not a plant microbiologist uh, or new to compost, this is something we can monitor or be aware of what is in the soil. Uh, confirm, uh, did you say compost can help suppress pathogens? Are there things to be aware of to make it safe for our kids or pets? Um, there, there's nothing at the backyard scale other than experience and time to be aware of. Um, I do, I, yes, compost can help suppress plant pathogens. Uh, it's been well documented, it, but it can be unpredictable and, and variable. Um, so just putting in there still has that general benefit of promoting uh, plant growth. Um, is there something to be aware of? Uh, just make sure that it's fully broken down. So make sure you give it enough time. And then you can say, even if it's not heating up, there's several reports out there that say just the intense uh, microbial competition can outcompete, the beneficial microbes can outcompete the stuff that we're worried about, like E. coli and salmonella. How tall should the lasagna layers be? Uh, it depends on how tall your green layer is going to be. Uh, so with my three different buckets that I add to it, uh, or three and a half, uh, my green layer is about four to five, maybe six inches tall, and I do spread it out pretty good, um, but I only take it to about four inches of the sides, and then I put on as much brown material as I think is necessary, uh, certainly cover it so you can't see anything, and cover it so you can't smell it anymore, and by the time you're done covering it, the odor is all but gone away. So it all depends. If you have smaller amounts you're putting at one time, layers are obviously going to be smaller. Dang, I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you for that comment. Uh, the same compost to be analyzed, same as soil, as nutrients, pH. Um, question was on uh, testing compost or analyzing it. No, the, uh, in comparing compost testing to soil testing, uh, absolutely not. Um, my compost is, they test it under different um, acid conditions. So they test it as if it's all of it's going to be available, much like a fertilizer, all of it's going to be available to the plant, uh, it, which is the practitioner wants to know that, that maybe uh, you get a rain event and a lot more becomes available. So it uses um, stronger acids to extract all the nutrients, whereas a soil analysis uh, is going to use weaker acids because we know 
uh, over, over throughout the many years of testing soils, not all of it is available to plants even under saturated conditions. Thank you for Rick, that you, comment. Rick, do you mind if I jump in with a question that I think was overlooked that uh, I, I yeah. thought was pretty interesting? I need to order compost in bulk as I don't have enough for my needs this season. I know what goes into my compost pile. What questions should I ask a seller about their compost? I'm also concerned about getting jumping worms uh, which are found in the area that I live. I'm not familiar with jumping worms. I've heard of them, but I've never seen them or, or worked with them. Uh, but the questions, if you're going to a an operation, you're not buying it in a bag from say Home Depot. Uh, if you're getting it from Home Depot, there's not much you can ask. You can look on the back. And I oftentimes that's municipal biosolid compost uh, is what I see. Um, in those bags. Um, but if you're getting it from an actual compost operation, just look around. You can see what's going into the compost. And more times than not, it's just yard debris. So it's pretty safe uh, to use. Um, I guess if you really wanted to ask questions, do they use grasses? Do they use horse manure? And uh, any meat products or even food waste? Um, the horse manure, it came up already. Can I use horse manure? that could contain um, persistent herbicides. Uh, so you gotta ask the, uh, what kind of herbicides are you using if you're getting it from a, some kind of um, horse operation. Um, if they're using grasses, uh, it's less likely to find persistent herbicides in grasses, but you can find, um, you know, just the residential use products, herbicides like Roundup, but those things tend to break down over time, either by nature in a compost bin, or they just have a chemically, uh, chemically they have a half-life. I think it's in either days or just a few months. I can't recall, I have to look up the report. And yeah, I, I'm not familiar with jumping worms. If it's an actual true worm, I guess I wouldn't be too bothered because of the benefits worms have in general. But uh, that's something I'll have to look up when I get off this. Yeah, Asian jumping worms are becoming pretty common in this area. Um, the cocoons are often found in potting soil. That's how they're spreading. And the issue that we're having is that they're just such rapid decomposers of the organic layer. It's really speeding up the nutrient cycling. So there's a lot of, I don't know how much of a worry it is for home gardening, but it's really a, has a lot of potential to be destructive to our forest systems because it's going to speed up that litter layer cycling. I see. And Rick, I've been going through the list and sorting out all the questions that I'm positive that you've already answered, but I know there's a, still a few in here that maybe you've touched on and maybe you haven't, if you want to scan back through them. Uh, through the questions. Is that what you asked? Yeah, yeah. I've been sorting out the ones that I know that you've answered, oh. but there's a few that I'm not quite sure. Sure, sure. Um, because the burn in plants in the last side, um, that was most likely the salt, high soluble salt content. And you could find that in vermicompost, compost. This was a liquid version. It's just, it was off the charts enough. And that's what caused that, um, that seed uh, situation, um, high soluble salts. There's a question about, can we compost biodegradable plastics? I missed that one. Um, research, oh, there's the research activities ones too. Okay. Um, uh, biodegradable or compostable in your backyard. I've tried for years. They don't work unless, unless they are like the bamboo ones um, or they are paper. Sometimes you get the paper straw ones. Certainly those will break down. Dixie cups, anything wax will still break down in your backyard. Um, but even at the large scale, uh, I get a lot of people bringing compostable bags. Uh, with my wind road turning system, um, even the uh, flatware, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for probably uh, structural reasons and, and the way my piles operate is because these materials are typically light. And so when I'm turning them, they float you know, to the surface in a way that they don't fall into the pile. So they don't get, they don't stay in the pile, but even in my backyard, they don't break down. And they're very difficult to actually know unless you see the box. So you can go to a restaurant or you know a takeout or whatever, and uh, like a food truck might say, "Hey, these are um, 
these are we have compostable flatware. Um, unless you read it on the box, I probably wouldn't trust it. I've gotten burned too many times with that. Uh, research activities in Italy. Um, we have uh, we're we're partnering with a uh, Davinus Davinus group, and they're a um, regenerative organic, uh, not pharmaceuticals, but uh, beauty beauty care line, I guess. Um, stuff that I don't use. Um, like, you know, fancy soaps and lotions and they, the inputs are a lot of plant-based inputs and they want to be able to grow those. They're, they want to do it organically, but they're partnering with us because they want to do it regeneratively, uh, organic. And, uh, there was a, a question on some of the other research activities we have going on. I say there's a lot of them. Um, weed management, either in the in vegetables or uh, grains. We have a hog swine project, uh, trying to reduce swine parasites um, in pastured pork production. Uh, the ongoing compost research that I have, um, just looking at the nutrient dynamics and composting uh, manu uh, swine manure to destroy the parasites. Um, we have an orchard that we're spraying, different spray regimes and looking into that. I'm trying to think of all, and it's just a lot of different techniques, a lot of tools we're looking at, new tools. Yeah, so it's hard to, I think if you went on a website, it, it would probably give you a little bit more. Does road salt impact compost? Yes. Um, I don't know how you would be getting in there except through the leaves maybe if it's being collected. It's just going to, that salt's not going to go away. So at the end, it's not going to impact the composting process, but it's not going to go away. Um, you're going to have a higher NACL um, in your uh, material, your final product. And so that's going to add to the soluble salts. Sodium is still necessary for plant growth, but too high can burn plants. I think we only have 30 seconds left. I think we are coming right up on 730. And I think you've yeah. done an amazing job of answering all these questions as they've come pouring in. I feel you impressed. Really right. still there. I did uh, address those. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for asking the questions. I hope the format was um, more dynamic than you used to. I know I, I think I'm going to continue to do that. It was my second time, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that works great. It, it's it's a good way to to make it a lot more informative i think to answer answer questions in real time you've taught us a great deal about composting and zoom webinars rick yes. thank you so much <laughs> all right well thank all you right. everyone yeah thank you rick thank you everyone for coming tonight and thank you so much for a very wonderful webinar season we're very excited to to wrap it up with a dive into the compost bin so everyone have a great night and thank you so much for coming and thanks a lot rick Thank you. Take care. Thank Good you, night. Rick. Happy composting.